So uh, first of all, welcome everyone. Uh, today we have uh, Matthias Hanauer at our um, finance research seminar, uh, who is currently a postdoctoral researcher at the Technical University of Munich. And uh, so he's really a friend, so be kind to him. Uh, last week he was very kind to us, so we have to re reprosecate. And um, his uh, interest is in empirical asset pricing. And he's not only an academic, he also works as a senior researcher at the uh, Robeco's uh, Quant Equity uh, Selection Research Team. So he actually knows both sides, industry and academia. He uh, obviously also holds a PhD, otherwise he wouldn't be a postdoctoral researcher at the moment uh, from the Technical University of Munich. He did the Chartered Financial Analyst um, uh, training and is currently a chart holder. And uh, together with uh, two of his colleagues, uh, Stefan Mintmüller and, and Matthias, uh, oh no, actually the two are uh, hosting the website uh, globalfactorpremia.org. Uh, so check it out if you are interested. I think it's a very good website. And uh, Matthias obviously also published uh, a lot of uh, research already and in very prestigious uh, journals, such as the Journal of Banking and Finance or the Journal of Portfolio Management. And uh, today he will talk about uh, a comparison of global factor models. And we are very happy that you're here at our seminar and we'll give this talk. And thank you very much. So the floor is yours. Uh, th thank you, Lars, uh, for the warm introduction. Uh, I think I don't have a lot to add. Uh, maybe only a small disclaimer that uh, this presentation today uh, yeah, uh, reflects my, my personal views and, and the views maybe are not necessarily shared with Rubico. And uh, this is also a um, yeah, paper. The paper is written clearly with my academic hat, although there is also a lot of, um, I think, um, overlap with yeah, what people on, on the pract practitioner side think is, is uh, how you should two factors and uh, how to apply them in the industry. So this is an uh, academic paper. It's called um, a comparison of global factor models. It's uh, yeah, uh, it's a single author paper. So I think the last time I wrote one is, was in 2014. So it's also fun to do it uh, with colleagues usually research, but it's also sometimes fun to do a research on your own. Uh, it has both uh, pros and cons. And uh, as the name says, it compares um, factor models on an international sample. So why do we need factor models? So factor models are nothing new. I think there's um, a very old and, and very uh, yeah, theoretically well-defined model, motivated model, the, the capital asset pricing model. It was already developed in the 1960s. And uh, although it has a really nice uh, theoretical appeal, the, the first test, how it performs empirically uh, did not show really good results for this model. Yeah, there were people found patterns in stock returns. Yeah, for instance, that smaller stocks had higher returns than bigger stocks, or that um, stocks uh, that had a higher valuation had less returns than stocks that were the lower valuations or cheaper stocks. And these patterns itself, they would not be a problem for the capital asset pricing model if these differences in returns would line up with differences in betas. But this was not the case. And therefore, these yeah, patterns were called anomalies. And uh, I guess most of you were familiar with maybe the, the most or uh, the first anomalies. Uh, for instance, smaller stocks had uh, higher returns or stocks with, um, uh, with say, a high fundamental to a price had uh, higher returns. But over the years, there were also coming more and more anomalies documented by, by researchers uh, all over the world. For instance, also very well known is the momentum effect that says that stocks that did relatively well over the last six to 12 months, on average, continue to outperform. And uh, also more recently, or then more maybe in, in the later 2000s, it was that Novi Marx, for instance, said there are firms that are more profitable. He focused there on like the top line profitability item, cross profitability. These firms have higher returns. And uh, also other researchers said they are like a growing balance sheet, so the total asset growth. This is also a negative uh, predictor of future returns. They all had their motivations and explanations why this was the case. Some had more risk-based explanations, other more behavioral-based explanations. But yeah, there were more and more um, uh, anomalies documented that uh, Cochrane said in his um, uh, presidential address at the AFA, uh, we have now a zoo of factors. So there are too many factors. 
And uh, what people, yeah, always from the beginning already tried say, okay, can we, yeah, try to to fit or to to narrow the zoo of vectors, to bring order into this zoo, with a kind of structure saying, okay, we have a selected number of vectors, maybe a handful, and these handful of vectors explain 90% of the anomalies. So therefore, it was already the case in the beginning that people extended this, yeah. Theoretically motivated model, the CAPM, uh, the more empirically motivated to multi factor models by adding factors. Yeah? And typically, these factors are always long short factors of equity returns. So the CAPM has only the market return or the market excess return of the model. And the rest of the additional factors that are added are usually long short factors. So they display, they measure return differences between several kinds of or groups of stocks. Yeah? For instance, the Farmer French three factor model first added as an answer to the uh, size and value anomalies a size and a value factor. Later, people added momentum factors because the three factor model couldn't explain momentum and so on. So, because there were a lot of yeah, patterns, anomalies related to probability investments, Farmer French added the investment and probability factor to the three factor model and it became the five factor model. Alternative models are like the Hu et al. Q factor model. It's also empirically, uh, um, theoretically motivated, but it has a big overlap with this five factor model because it's a model with the market size, investment, and profitability factor, maybe slightly dif different defined, or other models that are based more behavioral side, like the Stumba Yuan mispricing model. But as you see, there's not really yeah, one accepted model that everybody agrees on, but there is also a range of different models. So we might conclude that next to the zoo of factors, we have now a zoo of factor models. Yeah? This is also maybe not something nice that you want to have as a researcher uh, or even as a practitioner. They say, this is our model that everybody accepts. And this is really one that explains all of the anomalies. So this is a bit of, again, the motivation for the paper is, yeah, how do we compare these models? And, and the classical approach that is also called the, the left hand side approach was, that you yeah, take some test assets. Yeah, these are can be could be theoretically even um, single stock returns, but uh, it's not nice because they maybe have don't have coverage over the, the the full sample. But typically, you form portfolios, and you test how these factor models can explain the um, the return of these portfolios. And ideally, you want that they are fully explained by the factors and there's no intercept and unexplained part uh, um, remains there. So, and uh, how it's done because you don't judge just on the significant on, on an individual test assets, but test them jointly. And this is by the Gibson, Ross and Schenken test. And this was already done in the papers of 93 for the three factor model. The farmer friend showed their new model explains I think 25 size value portfolios better than the CAPM. And this is supposed to be a yeah, very long time accepted approach, how to compare models. So when adding additional factors and then having a variation of test assets is now the new factor model explains it better these, uh, the returns of these test assets than maybe the, the older model. But there's also now a new stream of literature uh, starting with the Barriers and Schengen in 2017 that say, yeah, this approach can be problematic. First, because it depends on the um, on the choice of the test assets. And there also might be, um, uh, if the test assets are sometimes maybe correlated with some of the factors, then it may be also have an impact on the order on, uh, on the results. And they also de demonstrate that yeah, mathematically, that when it's just the purpose about um, comparing the performance of the models, so by which is the highest Sharpe ratio that they can span, yeah, then it's the test act, uh, assets are actually irrelevant. And it's just about that you compare the models directly. And with these yeah, theoretical motivation, they had two follow up papers where they um, yeah, did the approach slightly different. And they found then with these uh, starting point when they compare models directly that a modified Farmer French six factor model that includes a timely value factor and is also the, uh, added the momentum factor um, that this model emerges as the best model. 
So if this is already done by a lot of people, so what is now my paper about? Yeah, all the papers before that I mentioned were solely on US data. And it can be difficult. Okay, the US is a very big market. Currently, I think uh, the whole the market cap, the cumulative market cap of the US market is at 60% of the, the world market. But on, on average, maybe this portion is, is lower because in the 80s, also Japan was, for instance, a very big market. Also, the US over the last 10 years did very well compared to the global markets. So maybe the US is big, but not everything. And also, past research has showed that some of the findings for the US do not apply to international markets. For instance, do you see my mouse actually? So this paper for, of, of Guyal and Vahal in 2015 showed that there was a momentum echo effect, uh, so it was called. So that momentum when looking 12 months back, it was more that the first six months of this 12 month, uh, 12 month period were more important than the second six months. So it's, you say it's more an echo effect was more important. But this finding seems to be unique to the US equity market. Uh, for the other 40 markets or so, what they tested, uh, it was not the case. Similar with Jacobs and Müller, for the US, it was found that there's a post-publication decline in anomaly returns. This is not out the case for outside the US. So be careful if some results are only shown on US data. It's good to do an out-of-sample test, so what do you call it, because it's some find documented for the US maybe if it holds also outside the US. And this is exactly what this paper does. So I take commonly accepted factor models that were compared in the US. I bring them to the international, to an international universe and check if I find the same order of factor models in this direct comparison test. So this is this paper about. Um, are there any questions so far? If not, then just uh, yeah, um, unmute your microphone and, and ask. So what, I, what is the contribution? What do I aim to contribute with this study to the literature? Yeah, first of all, I want to also to check what is a parsimonious factor model. Yeah, there are more than 300 factors out there, but I want to have like a handful or two handful of, of, um, of factors that have a high power. So this, I also want to, um, add to this uh, research question. I complement the analysis of Baharias et al. in 2009 in the US and check if the results carry over to international markets. If I would find affirmative results for their finding, yeah, if I find that the same factor model as they propose is also the best factor model in international markets, then this finance is less due to chance or data mining. So then it would really support their conclusions. I also add to the, the discussion about the importance of the value factor, because this factor is heavily criticized uh, recently. For instance, uh, the, even one of the early adopters of the value or supporters of the value factor, Pharma and French, find that actually in their five-factor model, it's redundant. So it can be explained by the investment and profitability factors. So, and they just keep it because of heritage. And also these newer factor models of uh, how et al or the Stamba Yuan mispricing model do not even contain a value factor. So this maybe asks the question, do we still really need one? Uh, yeah. And um, lastly, I uh, add to the expanded literature, uh, literature on international asset pricing. So what to say about the data and methodology? Um, I want to keep it uh, quite short for the data. Uh, it's usually where you spend most of the time on, especially at the beginning, but maybe it's only in mentioned appendix. So I use data stream world scope as data source and uh, have a sample period that is uh, nearly 30 years and uh, I can comprise 51 countries. And uh, so my country selection follows the, um, the MSCI developed and emerging market indices. So I classify a market as a developed market. If it's in this year also, um, defined by um, MSCI as a developed market. So for instance, it means that uh, Greece in the beginning of the sample is an emerging market, then it gets upgraded over time to developed markets. And then later, I think after 2013, again, emerging markets. I think it's quite stable if, if markets are developed or emerging, but for some countries also like um, Portugal, I remember that can uh, was promoted over time from emerging to developed. 
most of the time I look at the uh, global old country universe, but I also do regional um, tests later on. I also apply a lot of um, yeah, static and uh, um, dynamic screens to ensure data quality. So for instance, this means that I only include common stocks. The, if you download the, the data, also like preferred shares or um, ADRs are in the sample. So I want to remove them. Um, also the uh, one feature of data stream is that if a company is delisted, then the price and market cap and, uh, stay stable. So I delete these um, stable returns from the end of the sample to the first non-zero return and so on. Um, yeah, as a result, I get a very comprehensive global data set uh, that uh, includes um, more than 50,000 unique stocks, not all at the same time, but some uh, uh, drop in later, uh, then maybe also drop out before the sample ends. And uh, in total, I have like uh, seven and a half million stock months observations. So this is really a broad um, and comprehensive sample. But I also do not want that maybe micro caps uh, um, influence my results. Therefore, I usually apply evaluating and to make all these factors and models comparable that I investigate. So I use the standard two times three uh, sorts on size and the respective factor criteria. So big stocks are these stocks in a country that um, cumulatively make up 90% of the, of the um, uh, market, uh, market cap. And the remaining 10% are uh, small stocks. And then within uh, small and, and big um, buckets, I then have three groups, usually a high, neutral, and low, depending on the respective factor criteria. So this is usually quite standard. Some of the yeah, factor models, when they were set up, had like not these three portfolios in the other dimension, but five. But to really make the factors comparable, I, I apply these two times three um, sorts everywhere. Um, the, the model selection follows Barriers and Schenk in 2018, um, and I will now quickly go to this list. So the, the first model that I just include for because of the heritage is the CAPM, so it only includes the market factor. Then uh, what I have here is the Farmer French three factor model that adds the uh, size and value factor to the, to the uh, market factor. Uh, so I, I have here all the pharma French models. Here the five factor model add, adds now then a raw minus a robust minus peak, so a probability factor and an investment factor. And it's also extended to the six factor model by adding momentum. Then I have a variant of this six factor model where I just replace this uh, operating uh, probability factor by a cash based operating probability factor. So this is some nitty gritty. Um, yeah, research or uh, research stream that says what is actually best probability factor and to, to ensure that it's not just the results driven by the choice of the probability factor, I replaced this one also here because this is more or less what uh, choosing factors in, in 2019 of Pharma French say is, is the preferred model. Um, then I have this Q factor model with uh, the market size, uh, probability factor based on R&E and the investment factor. Uh, the standard yuan four factor model, market size are everywhere there. And then a management and a performance factor. So these are uh, factor composites. So management has, I think, four or five variables in it, like accruals, investment behavior, all the things that management can maybe influence. And uh, performance is more something like uh, probability and momentum. Um, so these are composite factor, and, and I followed um, the construction as it was done in the literature for international markets. And finally, this is like a modified Pharma French six factor model. This is the model that is also the best model in, in these two papers. So it has this six factor structure, but with two deviations. First of all, it's, um, the, it's not the standard value factor, but a monthly updated value factor. And um, as a probability factor, it uses this cash-based operating uh, probability factor. So this is a cash-based cash version. So you don't look at the, the book earnings, but more at, at cash earnings with some adjustments. What is the difference between this standard value factor and this monthly updated value factor? So um, when forming this value portfolios, what Pharma French are doing, they take the book value of the fiscal year end, um, J minus one, let's say. And then in the, uh, six months later, or at least six months later, at the end of June of the next year, 
they use this book value and uh, divide it by the market capitalization by the December year and the year before. So they use already a six month old uh, market cap to measure the valuation. And there's also some research more from the practitioner side. So SNS and Frosini, for instance, that say, yeah, this is some devil in the detail that you can improve because actually if you buy a car, then maybe the car was uh, like the, the setup where we was uh, defined several years ago, but you're looking at the price, not when the car was um, coming on the market, but maybe now two years later, it has a different price, even if it's brand new because of just, it's a bit outdated already. So you should look at the most recent price. So it makes sense to lack the fundamental data because there's some reporting lack, but there's no reason actually to, to, to lack the price as well. Why don't take just the most recent price, the one of uh, in June or not of December of the previous year, because if you buy a house, then you also, uh, when you measure valuation, look at the most recent price and not an outdated price. So this is one modification. And then say, okay, instead of updating yearly, this um, factor, we update it, it monthly, always with the most recent market capitalization. And what people saw, why it's maybe not as the standard was, that the standalone performance was a bit weaker, but because of this monthly updating, always taking the most recent price into account, we will see that it has some interaction effect with um, the momentum factor. So what I show here are more or less the, the descriptive statistics for, for the, the factor uh, models employed in my study. And uh, you see that all factors have positive returns and besides the market and size, all are significant because they have the uh, stats uh, above two, most of them even above three. And yeah, the, it's quite similar to the results that uh, for the US. It's uh, that you see, for instance, value and momentum factors are the strongest ones. You see that this monthly updated um, value factor has the same more or less mean as the, as the standard value factor, but it's a bit more volatile, therefore a bit lower t-stat. We also see that within the probability factors is that these cash-based operating probability is better than um, operating probability based on, uh, this is like a, um, uh, EBIT uh, minus interest expense, what this factor is measuring, and also better than the ROE factor. So this is also quite in line what uh, you see in the US. And also these management performance factors perform reasonable well, I would say. So please remember that these two factors have very similar returns. So you might, might think, yeah, does it really make a difference? Uh, instead of uh, looking at the, the price of uh, December the previous year by uh, instead looking at the most recent uh, market cap or price. So when you look at the correlation, it, it becomes quite apparent. So first of all, I want to highlight that factors from the same category, like here this monthly and uh, standard value factor are highly correlated. The probability factors here are also highly uh, correlated. Um, this management factor that has some overlap with, um, uh, or this performance factor, sorry, that has some overlap with momentum and probability has high correlation. The management factor is more correlated with investment. So this is, makes typically sense or perfectly sense. But now when we look at the correlation of the uh, momentum factor with the standard and the monthly updated value factor, then you see a big difference. So the standard value factor and, and momentum are slightly uh, negative correlated, but this, um, the monthly updated and um, value factor and momentum factor, they have a correlation of minus 0.6. So, and when you remember maybe the, your first lectures of, about Markowitz, so when <clears throat> you have two assets, both have positive returns and then they are negatively correlated, then you really enjoy big diversification gains because then you can combine them and the, the return is still the average of the two, but the risk get smaller when they're negatively correlated. And this already indicates why this model with the monthly updated value factor is better. Are there any questions so far um, regarding the factors and, and applied models? Because if not, then I'm, I'm now jumping a bit to the model evaluation. So the first, Analysis that I want to show here 
is a bit more to give some feeling or indication what is going on. It's not really a statistical test. What I do here is I have here for each row the model, and I show for uh, this set of factors which sharp ratio can I generate. So this is an ex post analysis. So which how should I combine the factor to achieve the highest sharp ratio? Therefore, it's also called the max sharp ratio portfolio. And I also show the weights of the factors within this maximum sharp ratio portfolio. So for the cap M, I can only, so the, I think you require just that the sum of the weights is one. That's the only one. I don't even require that the weights are positive. So for the cap M, it's only one factor. All the weight has to go to the, the market factor and I get an annualized sharp ratio of, of 0.2. When adding now these um, um, size and value factors, you see that at least globally value is very important and 70% of the portfolio is invested in, in, in value and it's, uh, the sharp ratio incre increases by four. You also see that these um, uh, Q-factor model, even without a, um, a value factor, by investing into this investment and probability factor even achieves a higher sharp ratio. But of course, if you have the full flexibility in to invest both in value and in probability, then so you get even a higher sharp ratio. So, and um, this is more or less the, like the ordering of the models already here. You see that this uh, former French model, I have to change my, my screen a bit. Yeah, is already the, the best model based on this exposed sharp ratio analysis. And when you compare it with the, the model before, the only difference is here, which value factor I use. Here I use the standard one, here the monthly updated one. And what you see by replacing these two factors, the weight of the value factor increases. And because of this very negative correlation that I told before, or explained before, also the weight of momentum increases. This is, uh, there's no magic going on. It's just maybe that this way to measure valuation is a smarter one. And um, it has also a drawback because this factor now goes more negatively against momentum so that the standalone performance is not that much better. But when controlling for momentum, you see this diversification again and, and you see, uh, but it has an effect on the maximum sharp ratio that you can achieve. Are there any questions on this um, yeah, more monthly updated value factor or what are the motivations or on it? Because this is more or less, uh, this is most important for, for understanding, I think the, the, the next results. I got a question. Yeah. Uh, did you impose short sale restrictions? So and this one not. So, uh, and but, how, but, how does it happen that you have only positive weight? Um, uh, because, because, for example, if you go, go back to your last slide, if you look at the uh, winner minus loser and you look at your performance. Um, this one. No, no the, the, the next one, the correlation. Yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering because uh, winner minus loser and performance have a very, very positive correlation. Yep. So I would expect if you go short performance on long to momentum, you would get more sharp ratio. Um, yeah, but these um, these two factors are never in one model. So here you hear the, the blank fields. So these are not allowed model combinations. Oh, okay. So these um, models that include the, the, the momentum factor don't include the performance factor. The only model that includes the, the performance factor is the, this UAM Stumbo model, but mm -hmm. this don't include the, the oh, momentum okay. factor. So I, I don't think, I don't remember if I have in the paper line all, maybe I had it in the beginning. Maybe then you could see this results. I, I'm not sure, but I don't, I'm not even sure if, if you see it. Uh, I would have to, to check it, but this is explains. So I didn't impose uh, uh, the, like the, 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 the condition that uh, weights are only positive. It's, I, I would allow negative weights, but uh, you just don't see them. But you're right, yeah? So if two factors are very negative, uh, highly correlated and one has a higher mean, then you could maybe uh, yeah, play a long short game here. 
like an arbitrage like kind of thing. Matthias, uh, since yeah. I'm I'm coming from corporate finance and maybe that's yeah. just a different way to, to deal with that, but I'm I'm wondering if you compare these values, uh, I would be you know interested whether they are actually uh, statistically significantly different uh, from each other. Yeah. And to me, it looks like you know you compare them, but you don't know whether they are really different, right? This is what I do next. So this was a bit also only showcasing how these portfolios are composed and like also showing maybe the the, uh, the economic significance of the results. Yeah, you see that com for instance, compared to this model here, it's nearly doubles or it's, it's gains of 20 to 50%. But this is uh, what I do next. And uh, this is this table here. It's a bit, so I don't want to um, bother you with all the technical details. So this is uh, also a methodology brought up by Marius and Schenken, how to do this, how to compare the Sharpe ratios. Uh, this, um, you can uh, create this uh, Sharpe ratios with matrix algebra uh, when you have the expected return vector and the covariance matrix. But then, yeah, finding if they are um, um, significantly different is a different question. And then they, Difference there between nested models and non-nested models. Nested models means that all of the factors of the smaller models are also part of the of the larger model. For instance, here the three-factor model is nested in the five-factor models because these three factors are all in, in this five-factor model. But for instance, these two factor models are not nested because the, the performance and management factor are not part of the Pharma French five-factor model. And what they say, okay, if you have um, nested models, then what you do is just you take the, the non-included factors of the larger model, um, regress them of the factors on the smaller model and check if their alphas are jointly different from zero. If this is the case, uh, it's kind of a spanning regression, then uh, these two factors add to the uh, investment opportunity set. And um, then it also the max means that the maximum sharp ratio is significantly better. And for these non-nested models, they do a, a direct maximum sharp ratio test. What is really the, the statistical details of their paper in this 2019 paper? They really bring up this new test and then uh, as an empirical exercise apply it then to their factors. But this is not the contribution of my research. They provided the code on their website. I took it, looked at it, and then uh, just applied it to my vector set. And uh, what you see here, because these um, before I showed the annualized uh, maximum sharp ratios, but this test is built on the um, yeah, difference in the squared sharp ratios, but the order uh, stays the same if I square the, the sharp ratios. And what you see in the upper panel is that you have here differences, yeah, and I ordered the factor models cap M to this um, yeah, modified from a French Tix factor model by the squared sharp ratios. So therefore all these uh, numbers are positive. And here on the lower panel, you show, I show the, the, um, the, uh, the statistical significance, the p-values. And what you see here is that this six factor model, the modified one, is significantly better, has significantly higher maximum sharp ratios um, than all other models. And um, it's also, there's also some technical detail is that for instance, that you have like an adjusted maximum sharp ratio, you can think about like an adjusted R square. So if you just add random factors to an opportunity set, your maximum sharp ratio cannot go down yeah, because if it's, um, has no uh, contribution, then the weight would be just zero, but they have like an adjustment factor for that that um, punishes a bit uh, factor models with more, um, with the higher number of factors. So this is more or less the, the statistical test for it. You also see, for instance, that the, the uh, Stammer Yuan four factor model and this standard Pharma French six factor model, they are not statistically significant. So here on this diagonal, you compare just the model with the next uh, worst one, or, or the, if you go this direction, the, the model with the next best one. So the Pharma French three factor model is significantly, has a significantly higher sharp, maximum sharp ratio than the Cam M. It's not the case that the, the Q factor model has a higher sharp ratio than the three factor model. It's also not the case that the five factor model has a higher sharp ratio, but for this model, it's really um, beating um, all other models uh, at the highest statistical, uh, statistical levels. 
I think this this answers your, your question. Um, because, yeah, there are a lot of, of, of tables, but I also always try to um, summarize the paper in, in one graph, one figure. And this is what you hear, see here. What I see show here, the, the gray dots are, so the, the, the axis are here is the standard deviation, so the risk measure. And on the y axis, it's the average return. And I plot here in, with gray dots, the, uh, the, the underlying factors. So size has a rather small return. Uh, market has a high return, but it's also very uh, volatile. Therefore, it's not significant. Uh, we saw that uh, momentum and value have the, the highest returns. And uh, these uh, curves here are the efficient frontiers for the different models. So uh, in, the, um, in the graph with the maximum Sharpe ratios and the model weights, you saw the, the composition for this tangency portfolio. So these are the colored dots. But if you say for this set of factors, I want to have a higher return, then it also means that you have to take higher risk. So, um, and usually what you see that at the very right of the factor models, it's always invested in the, the factor with the highest returns. But here, I, I think I require positive weights for, for this graph. But it's just, you see that this red line, this is this um, modified Pharma French six factor model with the monthly updated value performance. Yeah, you see, if you just want to have a very high return, then everything is invested in the, in the momentum factor. But at these um, lower return, also lower risk levels, you see that it dominates the uh, next best model. So it's the Pharma French model with this cash-based probability factor because it's for the same level of risk, you get a higher return. And this is just uh, a graphical illustration of, of the paper. And uh, so what we more or less evaluate if this dot here has a higher return to risk ratio than this dot here. But I, I think it's it's not just this point is better. The other one, it, it dominates it also over a broader range of, of, um, of, of risk standard deviations. Also, so this was more like the contribution that I said, yeah, I, I want to add to this literature, what is the best factor model? Uh, so as in the Barrias and Schenken papers, I find that the six, six factor model with a cash-based probability factor and the monthly updated value factor is the best model. And I want to bit, dig more in why this monthly updated value factor is so important. And what I do here, I do spanning regressions. So my dependent variable is always the, a high minus low return of this uh, monthly updated value factor. And on the right hand side of the spanning regression, so this is a linear regression, are these factors that I show here per each line. So if, uh, for instance, if I regress the, this monthly updated value factor on the uh, factors of the Pharma French C factor models, then I see an intercept of 0.27% per month. Yeah, so maybe 4% per year that is uh, highly significant and has a T value of, of seven. Uh, although it's highly correlated with the value factor here. It has a correlation of 90%, but it's also ne very negatively correlated to the value factor. And this one also has a positive return. So this pushes up the, 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 the alpha. The same applies if I replace here this, uh, um, this probability factor from the Pharma French uh, 2015 paper with the one that they propose in their 2018 pa paper, the alpha goes a bit up even and is even more significant. It's the same when I request it on the factors of the uh, Hu Su Sang uh, four factor model or the Stambao Yuang four factor model. It's always the case. And what is really like a, like a pattern. So these intercepts are all positive and significant. And the driving force seems to me, although even when, when value is included, this very negative correlations to probability, or in this case here, the performance factor that also has momentum and probability built in. And as these factors are all having positive returns, this negative coefficient in this um, uh, spending regression pushes up the alpha. You can say, interpret this that, okay, cheap stocks measured by book to price are cheap, but also have, um, uh, uh, lower pro uh, probability or worse past return. And then if you would build here like investment products out of it, portfolios, then it would make sense not only to look at the book to price ratio, 
but also look at the, the probability and momentum score of a stock, combine them. This may be some, some insights on, on the role why we see here this alpha, because it means when you have here an alpha for this factor model, then adding this dependent variable, the high minus low return, to this set of factors would increase your Sharpe ratio. Um, yeah, I have now uh, three slides on robustness um, tests before I would conclude. So I was doing this analysis, this was an exposed analysis over the whole sample period, but I was wondering, yeah, factor performance, factor returns, and therefore also model performance can vary over time. So I was dividing uh, my sample into um, yeah, buckets of five years. And uh, I see that, yeah, across actually every five year window, except for this period uh, here, where this model is slightly higher. So I show here the analyzed Sharpe ratios. This model is in all sub period the best one. So it seems very robust because even in this period, it ranks on place second with only a very small distance to the best model. Um, I think it could be a bit worse if I would add uh, here two more years. So last two years were very bad for value. So it could be that we would see a similar case as, as uh, in, in this period. But um, overall, I, I'm convinced that the results would stay the same. More interesting from my side was also how does it look for, for regions? Yeah, because also this Jakobs and Müller uh, show that uh, there's a lot of uh, different factors that play a role and these most strongest factors per region can differ. So I was doing the same analysis, but just not on a global level, but on a, a regional level. So I was dividing my sample into Asia Pacific, Europe. So these are developed markets, these three, Asia Pacific, Europe, and Japan and all emerging markets countries. And uh, what you see here in all, it was striking these results because I started with main results and then was really yeah, excited if, if they're also robust. And you see that across all, um, um, all, all regions, this um, Paris and Schengen model is the best one. The defects are more, most pronounced for Japan. Uh, maybe some reason here because uh, in Japan, uh, we know that momentum is not really working, and therefore this um, standard, uh, um, this monthly updated value factor, as even a, shows even bigger improvement to the the standard value factor. And also, you see that this cash based probability factor is much better than the other probability factors. Um, and then I also did some um, yeah small deviations in my 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 uh, empirical setup. For instance, here, I, instead of uh, sorting the stocks per country into buckets, high, neutral, low, I do this on, on regional breakpoints. So in the end, I pool again all stocks, but how I classify it, I do it either on the country or the regional level. Um, it's very robust. I remove micro caps. I get nearly the same results because I apply uh, evaluating. So by removing micro caps, I only take out, I think about 3% of the accumulated market cap. So it's, this is how I define them. But in numbers, these are about 60% of the stocks. I also say, okay, this, um, the Hu Su Sang paper, it has a different probability factor. What happens if I would uh, just give them also the best probability factor for my sample? But you see, even then, it's still a quite big difference between these models. Uh, some factors, uh, for some factors, I don't include financials. For, for some, I do. Therefore, if I would remove financials from all factors, what would happen then? No change. And uh, for the, the performance factor definition, I did not include this Altman C score and uh, also an uh, default risk score uh, because these were parameterized um, uh, scores that were yeah, fitted for the S, but therefore also the, the authors themselves say you shouldn't use them uh, internationally. But if I would just do it, uh, even here, you, you don't see a big difference between this model here, it even gets slightly worse. So even uh, for this uh, range of uh, uh, methodology changes, I see that my results are very robust. Okay, uh, summary of, of the main findings. So I document first that all the factors, underlying factors, uh, exit a positive and besides the market and size factors, very significant returns. Uh, I find that the, the six factor model proposed in Paris and Schenken is also the best model for the, the global XUS universe. 
uh, this uh, improvement in the Sharpe ratio is not only economically uh, um, strong, with about improvements of 20 to 50 percent, percent to the next models, but it's also uh, statistically very significant. And I also show that the, the main problem for these uh, for the dominated models is that they don't include an efficient value factor. Um, and this is also what I, I showcase with these um, spending regressions. And, and finally, I think my results are very robust. Um, and uh, it's always good to, to see that it's not working in just one setting, that it, but it's quite stable, the results. Uh, what should we do this uh, with this um, yeah, results? Um, I think that this, that this affirmative result for Barriers and Schenken um, is also gives a, a strong conclusion that uh, this modified six factor model should be used as a be benchmark model um, in a, as a base case. And therefore, we also share this uh, the factors on the website that uh, last mentioned, so globalfactorpremium.org. There you can download the, the fact series yourself, not only for these regions, but I think for uh, around uh, 35 to 40 countries. It's, only, it's At the moment, it's only updated until um, October 2018, but uh, we plan to update it uh, later this year uh, until at, at least end of 2020. Um, yeah, and we hope that this um, uh, more powerful factor model is also able to explain more of the other factors. So we include here only uh, six factors in the models, but there are ma many more outside. And I think this in the next revision of the paper, I will apply it to maybe not 300 test assets, but as a, a really a test to maybe 30 or 40 factors. So this is the next step in the research. Yeah, this uh, was it from uh, my side. And I would be happy uh, to, uh, to answer your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Matthias, for this uh, illuminating talk. Um,